Hello, and welcome to Rewildology, the podcast that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. When do you think of Costa Rica, what images come to mind? Maybe you see white, sandy beaches, sea turtles, and surfers catching waves. Maybe your mind fills with images of rainforests, wildlife, and trees as far as the eye can see. Or perhaps you picture slow-moving sloths, flashy scarlet macaws, and brightly colored poison dart frogs. All of these are beautiful, welcoming visuals and indeed characterize this incredibly biodiverse country. But what's going on behind the scenes of all this beauty? Is there a darker side of wildlife tourism? If so, how do we combat it? This episode is part two of the Costa Rica Life, Lava, and Forest series, and today's guest, Adriana Aguilar Borbon, is an educator and volunteer manager at Proyecto Asis. Adriana began her career as a business specialist at a large corporate company in San Jose, but always knew she wanted to contribute more with her career. Through the grapevine, she heard that Alvaro del Castillo, co-founder of Proyecto Asis, needed help running the organization, and so she visited the facility to see if she could assist in any way. It didn't take long for her to realize she had found her calling. She moved to the project's facility, and Alvaro and Adriana fell in love and started a family of their own. Now, Adriana is an integral part of the project's mission to educate the public about the darker side of wildlife tourism and human-wildlife conflict. All the animals at their facility were either confiscated by the ministry or injured due to coming into contact with humans. She views every interaction as an opportunity to educate people on how to properly live with wildlife and why animals are better in their natural habitat and not in our homes. Because of her hard work and dedication, Adriana is also a member of the Anteater, Sloth, and Armadillo Specialist Group for the IUCN. If you're liking this show, don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to be alerted when the next episode of the series drops. Also, share this episode on your Instagram story with your favorite takeaway and tag Rewildology. And you can also leave a rating and review wherever you're listening, which will also help others organically find the show. All right, everyone, here is my conversation with Adriana. Well, hi, Adriana. Thank you again for taking the time to sit down with me for an episode of Rewildology. And of course, for hosting me and Lee in Costa Rica, you were definitely a highlight. And we even bought, did I tell you that we got, please tell me how to pronounce it, a corridor? Ah, Chorreador. Oh, Chorreador. Okay. Yes. Okay. The one it's to make coffee? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you showed us that. I told you well. <laughs> <laughs> you did teach us very well. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Lee, we have to bring one of these home. From the moment we saw you, we found one and we brought one home. Yeah. Chorreador? Chorreador. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky word. I understand you. Sometimes you have to help me with some of your words because of that. How can I pronounce this? Yeah. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. Yes. Yes. So that was an amazing experience and visiting your facility was truly a highlight. And I am so excited to share with everybody else the amazing stuff that you're doing. So before we get to all of today, let's go back in time and maybe explore your childhood a little bit. So Take me back to when you were a young girl. What were you into? How were you like as a child? And what is the story that got you to Proyecto Asas? This is crazy, you know? Well, first of all, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be with you one more time here. You know, you came to the project and we really appreciate it. And now being part of your podcast, that's another tricky word for me. <laughs> Uh, this is amazing because that's the way how we can reach more people and educate that this is our mission. About your question is kind of weird because I never, never expected to end up teaching about what life, you know? So I know that I am the person that loves animals and we had, well, dogs, cats, not, not cats, mostly dogs at home. Even... I use my own example that we used to have some Costa Rican wildlife as pets in the past. That was like the Costa Rican tradition, you know. So yeah, I like the animals very much. 
but I didn't expect it to end up here at the project. So it was like somehow during the years, I knew when I was working, when I got my career, I said, I want to do something meaningful. I want to do something with meaning in my life, but what can, what can I do, you know? And then I met my current husband, Alvaro, and in that moment, it was just for a job. Uh, and yes, here I am. Yeah, because if I remember correctly, you were a business expert, right? Like you went and studied business and he needed business help, right? That, that was the connection that started all of it. Am I recalling correctly? Yeah, this is also a little bit crazy. You know, I heard about him and his family because my grandparents used to be his parents' best friends in Liberia. Our difference is just five years old. The difference of age we have, that is nothing now. But when I was in elementary school, he was in high school, so I never met him. But then when I was working in San Jose for a car rental, so a friend in common told me that he needed someone to help him with something. And then I called him and it, like a month later, he proposed me to come and work with him. So as I told you, I had a good job. I like it very much, but I wanted to do something meaningful. So I thought about this opportunity and I said, is this what I'm looking for? And I took the risk. I told to my mom, I want to start over. I want to move to San Carlos and see how things can go. And here I am almost 11 years after that decision, you know? Yeah, because it's not like your location is near a city. You are pretty out in the middle of nowhere. So going from the capital city to your current location, I'm sure was pretty crazy in your family's eyes. <laughs> yeah. Especially my mom. She was like, are you sure? What are you going to do if some, for some reason, some reason things don't go well? I can start over again. Something tells me in my heart that I'm taking the right decision right now. Because the animals are showing me that. I saw the way how the animals were responding to him. And I was like, this guy has such a good heart. They don't lie. Just with their expressions, their emotions, you know, they don't lie. They don't have a way to lie, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. Animals are, especially if you're in tune to their reactions and their behaviors, you could tell pretty quickly. And all, yeah. I mean, yeah, I met Alvaro too. He's an amazing human being as well. And so it's not surprising at all that you were like, okay, this is, this is a great location and a great person to be around and eventually fall in love with and now we have a wildlife romance story <laughs> yeah no and uh, through the years I found out what was my mission you know here on earth so I wanted somehow from my point of view try to tell to other people how we can do the same how can we contribute to this planet because we need to contribute more how can we remember things that we forget so easy day by day? So it's like having this big chain all around the world of people with the same mentality, taking care of this planet. That is what is needed right now. Mm. Oh my gosh, I could not agree more. And you're a great educator. This is why I know this conversation is going to be so fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's get back to Proyecto Oasis itself. How did it come to be? What is the story behind its existence? Well, the same Alvaro's father was visiting San Carlos. He's a vet. He's retired now. And he wanted to have a property, you know, where to live. But then as soon as he, as he moved to San Carlos in the 90s, he became good friends of some of the forest rangers in the area that told him that they were having many issues related to what life. So he wanted to help. He believes a lot in St. Francis of uh, uh, Assisi philosophy about keeping in harmony mother nature, animals, humans. So yeah, he said, no, if you have some situations with what life I can contribute, I'm a vet. So he started with the project and then he found out that, okay, I have animals here, but I need to take care of them. I don't have the money. How can I do? What can I do? So he spoke with Alvaro about having the possibility 
uh, of developing a project for environmental education. And this is how they started mostly in the 2000s. So then Alvaro said, I want to teach people about what's going on with Costa Rica, with wildlife, with the ecosystem. So I want to have like a, a place where, where I can teach about this. So he started with some volunteer programs and also Spanish lessons. And then when I met him in 2000, late in 2010, let's say in 2011, uh, when he proposed me to move here to San Carlos to work with him at the project, we noticed that people wanted to see Costa Rica and wildlife, but for example, like for a tour. And we said, we don't want to open the doors just to let people to come in the project to see wildlife without knowing their stories, you know? So we wanted to tell them what are the things, the threats that these animals are facing in the forest and also with us, with humans. So this is how we started with educational tours day by day. Because we always say, you come to Costa Rica and you see all the beauties, which is fantastic. But we need to tell you what's going on behind the scenes, especially now that we are promoting more responsible tourists, tourism. So somehow, this is the, how do you say this? A short, long story is how you say it? Yeah, or, uh -huh. <laughs> the yeah. long and short of it. <laughs> exactly, like exactly. So yeah, this is what happened with Project Oasis. Oh, that is that is fantastic. So let's talk more about your facility itself and why it's different. So how do animals come into your care? Well, with the current with the current Costa Rican law what life and conservation law is forbidden to keep what animals in the house, which is which was super common here, especially in the countryside, in the rural areas. If I, I've been asking to people that I know, Costa Ricans, have you ever had, for example, a parrot as, as, as a pet? And they said, oh yes, parrots, parakeets. But now here, some people says also coatis, raccoons, boas constrictores, snakes, monkeys, monkeys all the time and well the animals that we currently have they used to be Costa Rican pets and they were confiscated by the forest rangers we are in the process because this is something that affects us with the COVID situation we need to update all the paperwork to open again the rescue center area because we want to support the forest rangers from here with the medical care they need for Costa Rican wildlife that they find injured for different reasons. But what we are doing here through Project Oasis is using some of the animals that they didn't have a chance to be reintroduced and they represent a specific problems in the country and how can we contribute. And this is what I told you, you know, before uh, chatting that I found this quote and for me it's like, okay, this is amazing. From this book, Letters to a Young Scientist from Edward O. Wilson, and it says, you teach me, I forget. You show me, I remember. You involve me, I understand. And this is what we see. It's very easy for us, somehow, to break the law. Ah, it is forbidden. Nobody's checking out. Maybe I can have this animal at home. No problem. But the thing is, what kind of animal you are having with you? Did you know something about the natural behavior of that animal? Did you know anything about the lifespan? And we always insist with COVID, they remind us the importance of keeping everything in a good balance. So now we are using the COVID experience as a good motivation to tell people, you know what? They deserve to live in the forest and we deserve to take care of them as well. We need to take care of them. Why? Because if we continue with this destruction of their habitat, my question all the time is, are you sure? Are we going to survive as a species? So yeah, some people say, I went to Project to Aziz and I learned this. Today, I was so happy because during the tour in the afternoon, I met a family that they told me we were here when my son was just one year old. And now he turned four 
and I'm coming with my new son, you know, and I wanted to, to, to teach to my child the same experience I had because it was a wonderful educational experience. So it motivated us to continue with this mission. Oh, that is so beautiful. And I'm sure that was all oh, just heartwarming and so rewarding to know that you had that much impact three, four years ago on this family that now that maybe their son can absorb a little bit more information, bring him back so that he can learn how to live and respect wildlife. Ah, that is just amazing. So since these animals are mostly rescued from a government body, you know, rangers or whoever, mm -hmm. some sort of animal control. Let's say the Ministry of Environment. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect, perfect, perfect. They are the ones that are rescuing these animals. So, so then what is the next process? Do they contact you and, and how do you bring these animals in and assess whether or not they can go back out to the wild or if they have to stay at your facility? So yeah, what is the process from confiscation to essentially a better life? Yeah, well, as I told you, that part of the process is in hold. The idea is to return again. But in the past, yes, they were calling, okay, we got this type of animal. Do you have a room for them? And it's important to know the story. For how long that animal used to live surrounded by people? Because it's not only about pets. It's about animals that sometimes they get electrocuted or sometimes trying to connect with another forest they got hit by a car or, for example, when we interfere in this educational process from the wild ones to the little ones, this baby animal, so I pick it up and I rescue it and now I'm bringing this animal to you. So it's important to know the story behind that animal because an animal that probably was surrounded by people for many years, they get habituated to us and you saw that with some specific animals here. You pass in the front and they are like super happy seeing people, you know? <laughs> yes. And this is not what you expect from them in the forest. You expect from them to run away from you. This is the, that, that's the normal behavior. So yeah, the idea with the help of a vet and a biologist, they can let us know, okay, for example, if this animal is coming just for temporary medical care, at the moment the animal gets better, Ciao. go back to nature. We don't want to keep you here because you are fine. You just needed a place where to recover and then you can continue with your normal life. But what about those ones that we know that behavior, it doesn't mean that it is domesticated, but many people say that, but no, the animal got habituated to you that is different. So we always insist about how important is the process for them from learning from their own family how to survive by their own, how to survive with a family. So sometimes when we interfere in those process, it takes a little bit longer or sometimes it gets complicated because you have one single animal, but that animal doesn't live solitary. It turns that this animal needs a family and you don't have a family ready for that animal in that moment. Or I like to use somehow human examples because that's the way how I can remember. And I want to make an impact on the person that I have in the front. So now that everybody wants to take care of them, you know, we eat healthy, healthier, or we exercise a little bit more. I always say using, for example, parrots and macaws that they used to live with the wings clipped for so many years or in a small cage. Let's think about that you want to participate in a marathon, but you don't want to exercise. You can sign up, yeah. How fast are you gonna run or how long can you run in that marathon? Maybe a hundred meters, maybe yeah. less than 500 because your body was not prepared for that. So somehow for these animals going back in the forest, it represents a challenge because of that, because they were not prepared for that. So they have all the natural instinct, but do they know how to recognize the food in the forest? Do they know which animal will represent danger for them? Do they know about the social rules of other animals? Sometimes they didn't have that chance because we got them when they were just babies and they have been surrounded by us. 
So how do we expect that they can survive without having all this learning process that is super important for them? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, there were so many parrots that they were clearly happy, happy-go-lucky parrots and, and other animals that, you know, they were living their best life considering everything that they had been through. So I want to chat a little bit more too about the different types of animals that were there. What are some of the most trafficked animals in Costa Rica? I'm sure that it's a blend of maybe people in Costa Rica for as pets, like you said, almost everybody until the law passed had wild animals as pets. And then around the world too, people want these animals. So from your experience, what are the most trafficked wild animals and how are poachers getting them from the wild? Well, thank you so much for this question because this is fantastic to talk about. When we have visitors here, one of the first questions we ask is, why did you choose Costa Rica for your trip? And most part of the time they say, because you have a beautiful biodiversity here. So we wanted to experience that. We wanted to see Costa Rica and what like. Okay, muy bien. Now I know that. Do you know something about the illegal wildlife trade? Have you heard about the six mass of extinction that we are facing right now with wildlife and plants and almost everything? Most of these people says no. Why? Because this is part of what you need to know when you come to learn about wildlife in general, not only Costa Rican wildlife. So as I told you, we want to open their eyes because this is something that we don't see often on the news. How many times you turn on the TV and you see about illegal guns, drugs, human trafficking, but how many times do you see on TV about illegal wildlife trade? Or for example, how many times you read that on the newspaper? Almost never, almost never. I always say that this is like a silent market so it generates billions of dollars each year, but we know nothing about that, you know? So when we talk about, for example, let's say spider monkeys, we have four species of monkeys in Costa Rica. So yeah, why we like monkeys, what is fascinating for us about them, or people say, ah, because they talk, they, they, do they talk or do they mimic? So talking about this natural behavior, what's the reason why we feel so fascinated that we want to experience having this animal in the house as a pet? And then how easy it is to get them? I remember there's a professor from Texas A&M University, Donald Brixman, and he wrote for an article in National Geographic. I met him a couple of years ago here at the project in a tour with Texas A&M students. He said, if you ask to someone, for example, from Europe or from North America, if they have had a parrot as a pet, they will say yes. And 99% of them, they will say, I got it from a breeder. But if you ask the same question to someone from Central or South America, they will say yes. And almost 99% of them, they will say, I got it from the rainforest. So the parrot we had at home when I was in elementary school, maybe my family paid to someone to get that parrot as a pet for us. So you saw the animals we have the most here are monkeys, parrots, and macaws. Those ones are the animals that people like as companion animals. I can imagine an old woman having her parrot and talking to her every day, Hola, mi amor, como esta, mi norita, and all these phrases, you know. And when they respond, imagine how excited that person feels like, oh, we have this special bonding, we have this special connection. The same with a baby monkey. Now that I am a mom, somehow, I can tell you, and don't get me wrong, I understand my son better because I worked with monkeys before. We behave in a very similar way. You say all the time, monkey see, monkey do, right? So maybe is this kind of different need of affection, the reason why we feel to attract to them, you know, or 
Now the famous ones, the Slavs. Everybody wants to come to Costa Rica, see a Slav. And there are some myths about the species that we see definitely is the marketing that is talking about the species that way because all this is not true. But now it's not possible to get them because it's forbidden. But it doesn't mean that if I pay extra money, probably I will can do. I, I can do that, you know? So this is this, for example, the spider monkeys, you can get them online for almost $16,000, just one monkey. And some people ask why some animals are more expensive than other ones. Check, according to the International Union of Inter uh, Conservation of Nature, what's the status? That animal is listed as critically endangered. So if we continue contributing on this, paying for animals that they deserve to be in the forest, we are part of the problem and not part of the solution. So in Costa Rica, we tell to Costa Ricans, remember the law, now it's forbidden. But what we tell to the people that comes to visit us from different countries, yes, exotic animals as pets are very famous, but what about them? What's gonna happen with that animal if you don't want to have it anymore? So where are you gonna return to that animal? In your forest, in an ecosystem where the animal doesn't belong to? Do you know the risk of doing that? And we, we can see some ecosystem disasters in other countries because of that, because animals that used to be super famous now are invasive species. So as I told you, it's important to have this reminder because we forget so easy that we believe if we don't contribute with education, what's going to happen? Oh, gosh, I could not agree more. Could not agree more. And it's just, it was so obvious, again, going to your facility and seeing the ratio of animals that were there. Like, it was very obvious which ones are the most trafficked, for sure. And I found it really interesting, too, when I came to your facility that you don't have sloths intentionally. Like, that is not that is not what we do. And one thing that I found insanely respectful, and it just shows that you all are in the right place, is you're not going to get sloths to make money. And not every rescue in the country can say the same. So I would love if you could speak about that a little bit more of your decision to maybe not get an easy dollar for the sake of wildlife. So if, yeah, whatever you want to say on that. <laughs> well, this is, well, one of the things that it's amazing, you know, when, when we see all this craziness about the slots today in Costa Rica, and I understand there's a lot of marketing. Many companies are using the slots as a, for example, to put a big sticker on their van for transportation service, just to attract visitors, you know, just to, because it's the animal that it's like a big fashion now. But we met a fantastic woman in Colombia. And this is something that also I want to highlight. You need to give credits to the people that deserve it because I'm not the expert here. I'm a person that I've been learning from different people that somehow touched my life. And I'm so thankful to them, to them that I like to talk about them when I have the chance, like this woman from Colombia, Pinka Plesi. I met her watching a TV program on National Geographic and she was talking about rehabilitation of that species. And I told my husband, I like the way how she does all this because it looks like she treats the, she treats the animal treats the animals very well, but I mean, it's a good combination of compassion and rehabilitation. So we were in touch, we have been in touch maybe since the last nine years. I met her four years after I contacted her for the first time because I got a few cases of baby slots that came to our hands for different reasons because the mother was not around or they fell from the tree or whatever, you know, the mother was attacked by a dog and all electrocuted. That is a big, big issue, unfortunately, with this species. So we went there. She came to Costa Rica. 
So we had the opportunity to meet here for the first Congress about rehabilitation, releasing what life in Costa Rica. And then we continue with this friendship and all this learning from her. And we went, my husband and I, two years ago to Colombia, two or three years ago to Colombia to get immersed in her rehabilitation program that at the end, if you understand what she says, you can use it with almost any species, you know? So one of the things that she told me is, Adriana, we need more compassion. We need to connect better with the animals because now we are treating them as toys. And it's amazing to see that we have lost like this disconnection from the natural world that we want to take them as our own pets, but we don't understand how important they are for us in the ecosystems, the roles they play. I like this term ecosystem engineers, because instead of seeing the animals just as cute, you know, no, they play something more important. So it's so easy to take cute pictures to post them now on social media and get many likes. But what do you want? Do you want to be famous or do you want to have an impact in other people's lives? So yeah, we started like two years ago with the Slot Rehabilitation Center here because of that, because we get many animals electrocuted. The last two that were on rehabilitation were released and the pandemic came and we had to close doors. So again, we need to get ready to continue with the operations. But more than that, also, we are talking to other people that they need to understand about these animals and how to take care of them. For example, the electricity company that provides us a service here in the area, Copelesca. How many times they get a report that a community lost the power because an animal get electrocuted, electrocuted. So we are trying to get, get involved with people that somehow in their day by day, they have to face a situation with an animal, but they don't have any idea how. So yeah, that's the idea. Having an animal here just to show it, but it doesn't have a story behind, that's not the purpose, you know? And so far, I can tell you the ones that we got, some of them were rehabilitated, the, the ones that they couldn't and died. Also, the stories, we are using them to raise awareness about them. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just really wanted to take a second to chat about that because, I mean, there are some amazing sloth rescues out there. And I've even had Sam Troll on from the Sloth Institute. Amazing facility. It's just, it was very obvious driving around, being what I would like to call an informed traveler and seeing how many places and how many signs on the side of the road that advertised seeing slaws up close and personal. You know, going to this rescue facility to see specifically slaws and pay money to take a picture with them. And going to your facility and seeing that that is so against every single moral that you have <laughs> was very refreshing and just goes to show how how in the right place you guys are and how much you actually love the wildlife that you take and hopefully assuming everything is all the factors are right then release them back into the wild which is beautiful I think at the end, Brooke, it's about the same. Sometimes you don't know everything and you need to investigate or you need to contact someone. Yesterday, I took the time to thank to some specific people that told me so many things this year about my cause, about situations with what life in the forest, emergency situations that I couldn't reach our vet and I needed to give a, an answer to someone that was contacting, contacting me. But it is, an, it is the same. It, some people, they deserve the credits. And I am surprised that sometimes in this world of what life, I want to be the number one. I want to be the expert. But I forget to thank to the people that has contributed to that in my life. I can tell you, I was motivated for doing this not only by Tinka, from a professor from Harper College, uh, Craig Stedner, that now is an angel 
that is, I'm sure is watching me from heaven somehow and guiding me. Another pro professor from uh, Texas A&M University and the different people that comes here and they are related to a specific story with an animal. I want to talk about that person because I think they deserve the honor. More than saying that you are the best place. No, we have so many things to learn. So we believe also about this kind of partnership. If I am the person that I don't know how to take care of this animal or how to rehabilitate it, but I know there is another one that has the knowledge, why I'm going to keep the animal with me if I know the animal will have a better opportunity with somebody else. That is also on the same page, you know, being very responsible, works very professional. So somehow this is what we want to do as well, because at the end, the ones that they have to win this kind of battle, you know, between humans and animals are then the animals. If they have a second opportunity to be at their home, we have to do that. I always say, especially to the younger ones, imagine that you are going back home after spending a beautiful time in Costa Rica. And then when you are at the airport, suddenly a policeman says, come with me, you are going to jail. Why? What I did wrong? No, nothing. We're going to put you in jail. Do not worry. We're going to hire the best chef for you. We're going to give you the most comfortable bed. But the rules are this. You can go outside and exercise 20 minutes once a week in no contact with your family. No phones, no books, nothing. Do you prefer that life that this man is offering you with a private chef cooking the best meals you can have in a very comfortable room? Or do you prefer your current life? And everybody says, of course, I want to be surrounded by, with my family in my bed that maybe is not too comfortable, <laughs> but I want my current life. What I'm going to choose that one because that's the way how the animals feel now trapped in enclosures, without their family, without their forest, without the food they get day by day in the wild. So I, 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 as I told you, I want to use some examples to think about this, like being on the animal's shoes, you know? That was a perfect example. Like, I mean, I even felt that just, <laughs> oh, that was, that was so good. And I now with COVID, we have experienced how does it feel to be oh isolated? Gosh. And we didn't like it. <laughs> we didn't like it. Right. So I think life is giving us all these lessons in front of our eyes. And we don't listen. And we don't see that. We were talking about the fire right now where you live. And we were like, oh, my God almost in New Year's Eve, and this is going on. And I told you, oh, Mother Nature has her own ways <laughs> to remind us. But are we going to learn the lesson? That's what I say all the time. Are we going to learn the lesson or how we see can we forget? Mm, that's, that's definitely the case. And she definitely gave us here in Colorado a massive lesson, a devastating lesson in the past 24 hours. So whew, completely understand what you mean. And, and it's everywhere has their own version of this catastrophe. And I know speaking in Costa Rica and having been there, habitat loss and then biodiversity loss is definitely really big problems, which you are, are educating so hard on to please let's stop this. We have to be in sync with nature. We have to love nature and stop taking the wildlife that is so integral from it. And I think that this goes perfectly in line with something that you've had a big hand in, and it is a Stop Animal Selfies campaign. And I would love, if you want to speak on it for a moment, what exactly this campaign is, how it came to be, and how you are adapting it specifically to Costa Rica. Wait, well, this is something that comes from our government, and I'm so happy that it is our government that is promoting this, the Ministry of Environment, because this year, for example, I was invited to participate with a SACS groups, which is an eaters, and slots, and armadillos specialist groups from IUCN for environmental education. And I told them about this campaign, and I asked them, do you think 
Can we find a way to promote this in the countries that we belong? Costa Rica is leading this campaign, but what about if we promote it in Panama, Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, Portugal? And they told me, I don't see your presidents supporting this. No, not, this is not the right moment. You know, they don't care about this. So what the campaign says is, okay, respect the animals in their natural environments. Do not interfere with the natural behaviors. And somehow there's a problem because we want to be part of nature. So we want to experience how does it feels to be in a bedroom in the middle of the forest. But then we have some neighbors that they are curious and they want to see who's staying there. A koati, a raccoon, a monkey, etc. So we are recommending to our visitors, you are here in Costa Rica. Let us give you the recommendations from Costa Rican government about how to, how to be a responsible tourist. But do not forget this. You can follow the rules in Costa Rica, but if you travel to another country and those are not the rules and you want to experience all this, selfies with animals, hands-on interactions with them, you have two options. You can follow these dreams or maybe what you have learned from here, you can put it in practice. So I invite you to put this in practice because I know in some areas, in some countries, there's a mess with what life. You can do whatever you want. And at the end, it doesn't make sense that this is something good for what life in general, and you don't want to follow these recommendations, you know? So yeah, we are part of the campaign. We are motivating tour operators, hotels, tour guides to be part of the campaign as well. Because the same, Costa Rica, it's a country that is well known for the biodiversity. But if we don't follow these simple rules, at the end, the animals are suffering the consequences and everyone wants to have a wonderful experience. But if for some reason the experience doesn't go well, who's guilty at the end? Me, because I didn't want it to follow the rules? No, people blame on animals all the time. Ah, this animal was a devil, they scratched me, beat me, blah, blah, blah. Well, you broke the rules first of all. So yeah, we are giving a voice to this campaign on our social media with our colleagues, with people that know that somehow they need to, to, to know about this campaign. Mm. And we are in touch, for example, with Roberto Vieto from World Animal Protection. And he told me, it's fantastic that from your perspective that you are taking care of what life, you can motivate other people like the tour operators to follow the rules, to the hotels, at the concierge, because I have heard so many times can I go and can I have this experience? How much more do I have to pay for that? Simple as that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I absolutely love this campaign because I have a pretty good understanding about why. And I would love for you to explain why because this, this seems so harmless. And I understand that feeling because, you know, when you go to a zoo or you go to these other areas, you can take as many photos of the wildlife and selfies as you want. And there's no repercussions. But it's different when we're talking about trafficked animals and we're tracking, talking about these other areas as well. So could you take a few moments to explain why taking animal selfies is detrimental to wildlife. What, what is the actual reason? Okay, yesterday we posted something about a coati, and I have the picture just oh, right here. Yes. This picture, someone from a hotel sent it to me, and it says, unfortunately, this animal got hit by a car. Very close, where there is a sign that says, drive slow, what life is passing here. You know, it's like a hot spot for them to use the road and cross to the other side of the forest. So we were saying it's not fair for these animals to die because of us. Every time we interfere with the natural behavior, they will pay the consequences. If I chase animals to offer them food, 
to take a selfie next time they see people, they associate that with a good experience. And at the end, we create all this disorder because now the coatis is easy to see them by the Arena Lake, just like begging, waiting for people to stop the cars and feed them. I have heard people that say, Adriana, but I gave them just a piece of banana and that's fine. That's a fruit. Uh -huh. No, you are right. But what about the next person? What about if the next person decides to give them a piece of fried chicken? That is, is so common. Or popcorn. Or what about if somebody is driving fast and they don't care about the animals crossing the road and boom, an accident happened. And being very honest with you, because I'm not gonna say that we are perfect. You know, I told you, we have learned also from our mistakes. I remember years ago, maybe eight years ago, that people come here and many times they told me, can my children experience the opportunity of hugging and holding the monkey babies? And we said, yes, in that moment, because we thought this is what they want and we want to give them this fantastic opportunity. But we saw the same baby monkeys when they pee on these children and the children were like, ah, this is gross, the monkey pee on me, or they poop on them. And we understood that means fear. They didn't like the experience. The children were fascinated, but not the monkeys. And also I saw monkeys licking on their hands and the first thing people do when they come to the project, they don't want mosquitoes bites, so they put on pop repellent. I saw some of those babies sick after leaking for many times, many days, the pop repellent. And then I remember I told Alvaro, we are doing this wrong. Are we talking about conservation and environmental education and somehow Doing this is like giving the chance to people to experience and to think about this is so easy that I want to experience the same day by day at home. So maybe I can Google it online. Okay, how much does it cost to get a baby monkey for my family? Because they had this wonderful experience, I'm going to buy it. So yeah, we agree. This campaign was necessary for this country. It was World Animal Protection the one that exposed Costa Rica, you know what? You talk about conservation, but you are the number seven country in Latin America providing hands-on experiences with wildlife. Also, I understand, and this is something that we have discussed in the group of specialists, the specialist groups, about when you rehabilitate wildlife, there is a very thin line about being a rehabilitator or exposing the animals in a wrong way. And talking about perezosos again, slots, I have seen pictures of these ones in a coffee mug. I have, I have seen pictures of the slots with glasses on a hammock, like, okay, pura vida, enjoy your Sunday. And the person don't think about the consequences of posting these pictures. These animals are shown just like stuffed animals, like funny, like cute. But when you want to contribute with education, also you need to be careful about that. And on the other side of the screen, what is the information that you want to share with the people that follows you or the people that is your friend, you know, in social media? Because now I take time to explain to my friends when I see them, swimming with dolphins or having a selfie with a nest specific animal, you know, I take the time and very respectful, I ask them, can I tell you what's going on behind that picture? Maybe you will understand my motivation to ask you to remove it from the, so the social media. Or oh, don't share please this information, this is completely wrong. And sometimes I hear, yes, Adi, please tell me about it or, Ay, Adriana, again, you with the same speech, I don't care. So it's little by little that we need to make these changes if we want to see a big, big change. I was talking about it with, with a couple from Poland today. I told them we need to start with our own family first, then with the circle of friends we have, then with the rest of our family, friends, cities, neighborhoods, because we blame most part of the time to the governments. 
to the presidents. Ah, you are not the ones that you are not taking the right decisions, but we are not helping on that as well. So we believe that definitely we need more people together in big changes. And the Stop Animal Selfish campaign is about this. It's about I motivate you, I gave you the information, and now you remember. And we are talking about this in your postcard podcast, which is fantastic. Imagine if some people ask you, can I get the information? Can I see it? What is this about? Can I follow the, the guy? What they said about this? What, 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 what we have to do? Because I'm planning to go to Costa Rica. What I need to know about the campaign before getting there. Así que thank you so much for mentioning the campaign. Of course, of course. I definitely want to take a good chunk of this conversation to talk about it because There's so many levels to it. One, it seems so innocent and I completely understand. And I hope that if anybody is listening, I don't want you to feel attacked at all because no. out, of, out of ignorance, you know, comes knowledge. And mm -hmm. I mean, when I first started my conservation journey, I didn't realize the impact of this either. You know, the having, posting those really special moments with wildlife is, is just a dream come true. And so I understand the desire. Like I really understand why somebody wants to go see a sloth if it's your favorite animal. I'm I'm a big cat freak. I love them. I'm obsessed. And I understand that desire and that want to go hold a baby lion. Like trust me, I understand. But <laughs> I'm not going to participate in any of those behaviors because I understand what it's actually doing to the species. And I guess this is kind of like a call out or a question or just a, a message to anybody listening to maybe go through your social media and see if there are any pictures that might be giving the wrong message. Even if you don't intend for it to, it might be sending the wrong signal or again, message to somebody who's receiving it that might not be as educated as you are on this topic. So taking animal selfies is not good. Just sometimes it's okay, but of in the grand scheme of things, usually it's not, especially if a wild animal was involved in some way, shape or form. That was maybe who knows where that animal came from. Was it confiscated? Was it illegally trafficked to get as a moneymaker at, at whatever facility you're at? That is a big driver of the illegal wildlife trade is just, you know, tourist dollars to come and take a picture with an animal. So, yeah, I... <laughs> no, and, and the other thing is the pandemic. How soon can we have another pandemic if we continue with these hands-on experiences mm -hmm. with wildlife? Mm -hmm. Because I always say, okay, that animal you have in front of you, do you know something about rabies, malaria, leishmaniasis, um, other zoonotic diseases? And people is like... Oh, you know, but why we have to talk about it? Because that's the reality. That's the reality. The animals, they have positive impact, but they can have also negative impact in our lives. So this is part of what we want to tell you to prevent you. Imagine you come here and you get a bite and that bite get infected. And then you didn't know that this animal was sick in the forest with something. And now you are sick. You end up sick in a hospital. Was that the kind of vacation that you wanted to experience or not? <laughs> exactly. And it definitely goes both ways too, especially the closer we are genetically to a species, the more likely our diseases are going to be transferred to one another. So that monkey experience could be literally deadly eat both ways. You know, well, we can see what's going on with COVID from some mm -hmm. what life getting it from the keeper, not on purpose. It was maybe just like an accident, you know? Yeah, yeah. There's so many cases now of and zoological settings with absolutely no fault of anybody's of, you know, big cats, other animals getting COVID. And luckily, they've been able to create COVID vaccines for different wildlife species. But holy crap. <laughs> I mean, talk about crazy. And the perfect example of a zoonotic disease going back and forth between animals and humans. So yes, that's a perfect example. But at the end of the day, also think about when you have the chance to see the animals 
in their natural habitats. That's amazing for me. I enjoy that so much. And I learned so many things from that also as a mom. <laughs> so I've been enjoying, for example, the boat bill herons nesting season now. And I can see that moms, oh my God, they care about the babies when they are little and they are feeding them. But now, then months later, when they grow and they want to be still in the nest they are like now away now it's your time fly away leave me alone (laughs) i always talk about this with my friends when for some reason they are living again with their parents and they are 30s or 40s and we say oh my god we are the ones that we don't learn the lesson (laughs) as the ones in the wild you know so it's hardest for us but definitely when you have the chance to sit down just to observe mother's nature, try to connect again with nature. You know, for me, it's so sad to see people that come to Costa Rica and with all the beauties in front of their eyes, and no, they are all the time on the phones. And I am like, are you sure? Are you sure you want to miss this special moment? But we don't know we we don't remember all the benefits we can get from the natural world to our mental health i can tell you by my own experience i remember when i was working in san jose i loved my job but it was so stressing out that my liver was suffering the consequences every year and now since i'm working here i'm busy There are some moments that I feel super tired, but even my doctor told me, what did you do in your life? Because you never got sick again from your liver. And I said, I I changed my life. Now I'm more more connected to nature. You know, I try to observe animals to learn from them, the way how they communicate between themselves. You know, now I'm not talking to them like, oh, let me, what are you doing? No, not that. Just observing them, how they behave. And definitely, I can see my health reflects that I feel much better. I feel like full of this positive energy that also we receive from them, you know? Oh, I cannot agree more with that. I have to go on my weekend hike. And if I go a couple weekends without my weekend hike up in the mountains, I, I physically feel it. I, mean, I It's just a complete reset for me. And I do live in the capital city of Colorado, uh, Denver, and sometimes it's hard. And so having that reset is so vitally important. And then to go see the wildlife and and its natural habitat. And of course, I always have my camera with me trying to capture something beautiful. But even if I don't, just having that experience, I, I literally call it my weekly reset. And without it, oh gosh. I mean, I'm like going a million miles a minute as it is. And so sometimes I just need to cool my britches. And so, yes, that that's definitely, I could not agree more. And you live on a beautiful property. And like, just like you said, what's the species? Boatbill herons? Is that what they're called? Uh, the oh my gosh. It's One, wild. those birds are so cool. They look like they were straight out of Alice in Wonderland. And seeing them all there and they had some caiman that were in your little pond, like I was relaxed just hanging out with you. And so just living there, I'm sure has been amazing and this for is your the, health. This is the perfect time to think about, okay, what can I do in this 2022 different? How can I contribute? Because sometimes we write down all this big list of purposes <laughs> and we check at the end of the year and it's like just one. Just one from 20 or from 15, I don't know. But little by little, we can contribute in a tremendous way. Now people talk about, talks about okay, the impact of plastic in the oceans. So how can we, how can we reduce plastic from one single use, uh, saving energy, saving water, recycling more, separating the compost from our water? garbage you know so teaching to others the good practices you have at home or as I told you taking a moment to from your perspective contribute with education to the things that you know better because you don't have to become an expert of everything 
just think about if you are very good at, for example, social media, okay, choose the material that you want to, sh yeah, to share in your social media. Be more responsible about this kind of post that you want to share with the community that follows you, you know? Or uh, do you work in a company and you know they have social responsibility practices? So can you share with other colleagues what you are doing in your job that definitely benefits the ecosystem, the forest, it, 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 it has a positive impact, you know, in nature. So try to not be so selfish that you want to keep all this just for you. Because at the end, as I told you, we need together to contribute on this. Because the clock is tick tac tick tac tick tac every year faster and faster, and we are not running as fast as is needed, you know? Absolutely. Gosh, I could not agree more. Sometimes it feels like a lost cause, but we cannot think like that, and we're not going to think like that. So I think my next question then is, You've given so many amazing pointers and just so many ways to think about traveling to Costa Rica. So let's say that somebody listening, their dream is to go to Costa Rica, or maybe they even have a trip coming up. What are some tips that they should consider as they're either booking their trip or they're getting ready to come to Costa Rica? How can they be re a responsible traveler? Well, first of all, I invite people, if they want to learn about Costa Rica and what my recommendations, go to stopanimalselfies.org and check on the recommendations of the website about how to be a responsible tourist when we talk about Costa Rica and what life. It basically, is that do not offer food to the animals, do not chase them, respect them according to the natural behavior. If you see... I don't know, it's like an iguana in a tree, don't go and chase it for a selfie. But also contribute to local, you know? Remember the tea we were drinking that day that I told you this yes. is green coffee with cinnamon tea? Do you want to try it? Because you are going to try Costa Rican coffee anywhere. And you said, yes, I would like to try it. We are supporting a, a, a local farmer that produced that tea and that coffee. So, so support local because sometimes we want to support big companies, big restaurants, and it's okay. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I mean, when you interact with the community, when you leave your impact in these other people's lives, Maybe somehow, somehow we can contribute little by little with that person that is offering his services for something, you know, and is trying to take care of their family, but the business is not going well. So, yeah, I have seen that. I love when people have the opportunity not only to enjoy all the beauties of the countries, they can participate in the local economy. For us, this is super important. Because yes, Costa Rica is very famous as a destination, but I have heard so many times, no, I went there. I stayed just in my five stars hotel. I didn't need anything else. And at the end, the other people that was waiting for you to sell you a small souvenir as a gift or as a memory of your trip or someone that wanted to take you, you know, for a tour, but this is a very small Tour operator that is a starting business, they need our support as well. Try the local food, it's delicious, but not only in that famous restaurant that has the best recommendations on TripAdvisor, go to the little one and support that little one too. So for me, those are the two recommendations I will give you if you come to Costa. Those are great recommendations. And I could not agree more having experienced all of that, you know, the the local restaurants and going to the local projects and the just, yeah. And even shopping local too. So when we were in Dominical, most of the souvenirs that we bought for our family were one coffee and chocolate, of course. And we tried to find local brands. And then we also found a couple uh, items of clothing that were made from the woman that was there. And we even got a picture with her, like your shirt, dad came from this lady right here. She made it. There isn't a tag because it didn't come from India. It came from her. 
And yeah, there might have been a premium that we paid, but it was more than worth it, more than worth it to support her and her tiny little business. And it was just her, this independent woman that is like making it on her own. And that story is so much better than, oh yeah, here's a shirt from Costa Rica. Cool. Which again, yes, I'm not trying to say don't get a souvenir. It's just like if no, you no, no, can, no, 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 don't get it wrong. If yeah. you have the chance, why yes. not? Exactly. If you have the chance, why not? That's perfect. That's perfect. So those are fantastic tips. And also, too, you have so much more fun. You meet local people. Costa Ricans are amazing. Pura Vida is definitely the culture, and it is fantastic. It is practice so- your Spanish. Learn some yeah. Spanish and try to practice that with <laughs> someone. Hola, ¿cómo está? Despacio, por favor, because we tend to speak so fast. Hola, pero ¿cómo estás? Ay, qué bueno verte vivir allá. And at the end, I can see people like, no, no, I don't understand what you are saying. <laughs> yes, and yes. yeah, practice the language. We're happy to teach you some words, some phrases. So don't be scared about it. If you are going to say or pronounce something wrong, we are not going to laugh about it. Like, ah, like now that you told me, oh, I got a corridor, but it was a chorreador. I told you, ah, chorreador, <laughs> yes. ah, that's fantastic. But I was like, oh, you got it, excellent. But I was not like, I oh, broke, no, what's that? Yes. Oh. <laughs> like laughing at me because I completely pronounced it wrong. Yes, because that's one, that's a hard word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it was, it has the two R's. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's like, blah, 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 blah. like my tongue doesn't know what to do with that word. But <laughs> now your challenge is to send me a video of you yes. making the Costa Rican coffee, okay? <laughs> I totally will. Absolutely. Hands down, we'll do that. Uh, it's, okay. it's it's on our countertop, so I will definitely do that. Okay. Excellent. So let's switch gears. Let's go back to you for a little bit. One of the questions that I love to ask on here, just to help humanize our stories, is not everything is rainbows and roses. Sometimes we do go through some pretty hard things. And I would love if you want to take some time if you're comfortable is there a particular time in your journey that has been really difficult that you had to struggle through that you would be okay with sharing with us well this is something that i didn't understand before and then again one day observing animals i learned it i i understood Okay, this is what you wanted to teach me about, you know. Uh, my dream was to have, uh, well, part of my dreams. Not, it was not my only dream, but when I decided to become a mom, I wanted to have a baby boy. I said, I want to have a baby boy. And I chose the name, Daniel. Because Daniel, it's supposed that that name means, like, you are going to be very, like, fair with all people, you know. It's the one that, that, that somehow like helps people, you know? So I said, Danny, when you grow up, you are not going to look at the person like through your shoulder, you know, see come above your shoulder, like, ah, this is me. No, you are going to be very respectful with all kind of people. And well, this is very, very personal, but at the, when, let's see, a year before I, I was pregnant, a group from London came, and it was a group of eight students with two tour leaders. And they came from, from a school that they were teaching to students with autism. I didn't know anything about autism in that moment. So I started learning about that. You know, this is something I like about Project Oasis. I have to learn every day something new. At least every day I need to learn something new. And then the year they came back, I was in labor six weeks early. Oh. So the day they arrived, I was at the hospital giving birth, Danny. So I remember I texted the tour leader and I told her, sorry, sorry, sorry. I am in the middle of this situation that I didn't expect it, but these other colleagues are going to help you with the students because they require very specific things, you know. And then they came back the third year and it was the last year with another group of students in that moment, Danny was maybe one year and two months. I realized 
thanks to all that I learned from them, that Danny was on the spectrum when he was just one and a half years old. I had that feeling, you know, something is different, something is different. And then I went with the doctor and yeah, she confirmed it. So in that moment, it was devastating for me because I said, okay, what I'm gonna do now? I, I have no idea what's gonna happen because he didn't speak in that moment. So I was like, is he gonna talk? Is he is, is not gonna be able to do it? So I started learning and learning and learning about that. But yes, I had those periods of time that I felt like, like in a roller coaster with my emotions. But then one day I read the phrase like, like the quote that autism is seeing life from a different point of view, you know, somehow. And, wor and working with what life, it's about that. You think as a human, what is the best for them? But then if you want to help the animal, somehow you need to think like that animal, you know? So for me, that was the biggest lesson in my life. My son is teaching me. Now he's high functioning, so he communicates a lot. And he has sometimes some sensory challenges, you know. But it's the same. At the end, I mean, when you know about what, what does it mean, the spectrum, and you see animals somehow, you understand them better because you are thinking from their perspective, not only your perspective, that you are the expert, you are the scientist, you are the person with all the knowledge, and no, this is wrong for the animal. If you take the time to observe that animal, that animal will teach you something about that. And a stereotypia, that wrong behavior, what's going on? Maybe the animal is finding a way to regulate themselves. You know, they feel stressed out. They don't feel happy. Why the animal is sleeping so much? Is that animal feeling very sad? Can you do something different for the mental care, you know? So, yeah, for me, that's been the, the biggest lesson from here, from the animals. And also, I remember Dinka told me once that taking care of baby slots is almost like taking care of baby humans when they are premature. Mm. And I remember being at the hospital with Danny and these words come into my mind. Taking care of a baby slot is almost like taking care of a baby human, a baby premature human, you know? And I said, oh my God, and I had the experience the past life, this past years working with this baby slot and I got so frustrated because some of them died. I didn't know why. And then I got very good information from the species. And well, when I was taking care of Daniel, I remember those recommendations from her. Not many people are around. They are very sensitive to the noises, to the smells, maybe just one, two keepers. So in that moment, it was just my husband and I. Remember, it's going to sound like crazy, but... Well, the feces, the feces are super important to see how the digestive system is working. So the same with Danny in that moment, you know, so yeah. My big mentors, animals, Danny, and these other people that I mentioned, it, you know. Wow, you were being trained all of your life to be a mom <laughs> and you had no idea. Oh, wow. And to even know and now I have this wonderful community of women, yeah. the women that we support each other, one in Spain, the other one in Colombia, one in Guatemala, I'm here so we can chat, we can share information. So yeah, when you have a community of people that follows you because there is a specific reason that they identify themselves as part of this family is what I say. It's fantastic. Oh, gosh. And I also love, I feel so much more special now that Donnie wanted to ride with the Hellos. <laughs> Yeah. When they dropped us off to know that he was on the spectrum and he felt comfortable enough to ride with Lee and me, like, I mean, one, I felt special anyways, because, you know, just to have a, a youngin want to tag along with strangers is one thing to know that. Wow. I felt I mean, really special. It's not about this kind of people say, don't put a label on him. No, it's because now that I'm here, 
And I see a mama that wants to experience with his family, with their children, Costa Rican what life is much easier for me. You know, the other day I had a family with four children. The biggest, it was like maybe 12. And then the little ones, they were maybe from four, six to seven. So we were in a tour. Everything was completely normal. At some point, this kid did something and immediately I said, you are in the spectrum, you know, I know. But the family didn't say anything. So I was very respectful about it. When we were in a coffee break, I told to this mom, uh, you know what, we decided to have virtual tours as a way to be in touch with the schools from other countries. So I've been given these tours the last time to a school in New York. I had two groups of students, but a couple of months ago, it was with a school in Florida that they specialize with children with different learning disabilities. Like, for example, when they are in the spectrum, immediately when I said that, she was like, <sighs> And I was yeah. like, you know when I knew it? When you said this is his sensory room. Mm. So you and I, we shared a blue heart, is what I told her. <laughs> and it's for me fantastic when they let me know, because I understand there are some challenges, like the parrots, that they can be very loud. So these little things that sometimes is difficult for them, now I understand. So with my colleagues and with other people that also... I work with, sometimes they ask me for recommendations and I know what to say. And if I don't know, I have good references. I know what, you can use this Instagram account. This is fantastic for this information. Or follow this woman. Oh my God, she's amazing with the postcards that she's posting about uh, different with different experts talking about a specific topic. But yeah, it's, it's like this. Now you and I, we are chatting, we are here. I feel comfortable because somehow I know this can contribute. And now also I know some people that has done excellent things for us as humans, they were in the spectrum, but nobody knew it in that moment, you know? Absolutely. And also too, you're such an amazing person. And I know that if anybody listening, maybe you are a mom or you have a sibling or somebody that might be on the spectrum and maybe you don't exactly know what to do. But Adriana, I'm sure that you would be more than happy to chat with anybody uh, that might be going through absolutely. something. I mean, even just maybe something difficult as, as a mother, maybe, you know, someone's child isn't on the spectrum, but maybe there might be something else that you would be more than happy to just chat through because I'm not a mother. And so I'm, I will not even try to fathom what it felt like for you to experience that and to have that moment. So yeah, you're amazing. And I know that you would chat with anybody. So I, I welcome that. And of course, I will make sure that I put every link possible to contact you in case somebody wants to talk to, with you specifically about that. Yeah, but on the flip side, on the flip side of that, do you have a particular story or, or a particular moment that you are so happy or proud of or that was particularly crazy, a crazy wild animal story? Do you have anything else that comes to mind like that? Well, this year I felt so honored when the, this organization invited me to participate with them for environmental education, the the specialist groups from the IUCN, especially with the Senartas and all this situation that is happening in our country with the perezos, with the slots. So this, this was like a dream come true, you know, because I, I like to learn from people that is in the field. And it's funny because sometimes I am talking to Mariela Superina, that is the chief of this group of specialists. And sometimes she used the specific terms that I am not familiar with. And I am like, okay, can you explain me like a first grade child? What does it mean? <laughs> I don't remember. I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah, yes, of course. This means this and this and this. But with the animals, it's, it's well, every day is different. One of these days, I experienced something that it was kind of crazy, but I had a dream with a, with a macaw here. 
that I felt somehow she was asking me to help her with something, you know? And I woke up and I was like, okay, I, I felt like this bird was talking to me in my dreams. And then I went to the enclosure, I saw her, and I knew why I had that dream. I found out, okay, you were communicating with me about this. Now I got it. So sometimes, sometimes, you know, when you talk about reintroducing animals again in the wild, after being surrounded by people for so many years, most of the people will say, no, they don't have a chance. And they give you the reasons why not. But sometimes I would love to have like the opportunity of trying and giving them that second chance, you know? Of course, we have seen other experiences that like, for example, when you came, we saw the two wild white-faced monkeys around that since the pandemic started, they decided to come and visit us day by day. Now it's a little bit of a headache because they like to destroy whatever they can in the kitchen <laughs> area we have for the animals. But <laughs> the little mafia is what I say. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, sometimes deep in my heart, I feel we need to understand better the animals. We need to give them a second opportunity because it's not only the animals that are living at Project Us, it's how many animals are living in the same condition all around the world. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's something a little bit crazy. And I always say, yeah, maybe because I'm not in the same field, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a vet. Sometimes it's the way how I see the things from, you know, being back, here like thinking about it what about if we do this or we do it this other way uh yeah these experiences of learning from them it's it's a kind of motivation sometimes there are some days that i say this is so hard i don't know if i want to continue and suddenly i pass in front of one of the species we have here and they do something and for me it's like Thank you so much. You made my day. Now I understand you are motivating me to say, like, to, okay, keep going. Keep going. Do not worry. You are doing well. You are doing well. Yes. It, it's, it takes an army. It takes a village. It takes all of us. And all of us with our different expertise and life experiences, if we really want to make a big impact in the world. So, my, my next question then, since you have the floor right now and to anybody listening, you have their attention. Is there one message or a piece of advice that you would like to share with them? I, I'm, I'm going to highlight this quote. This quote is amazing. You teach me, I forget. You show me, I remember. You involve me, I understand. Try to think about that. Try to remember this day by day, in every action you do in your personal or professional life. Don't blame people. It's, it's so easy to say, ah, that's your job and you, want, you don't want to do it. You don't know what's happening in that, with that person. You don't know if that day that person came to the office and it's dealing with so many things in their heads. So try to be more calm. The, the compassion we need to show to each other, you know, because now we are just like machines, working, working, working. We get home and then I need to continue working because I'm getting messages from my clients. And no, try to stop, reconnect yourself, charge your batteries again, your energy, and try to give your best. But do not forget that also you are a priority. You need to take good care of you first before taking good care of the ones that are surrounded, surrounding you, you know. And yeah, try to be with people that motivates you to go to the next level. Sometimes when work here gets hard with different people in different ways of communication that we share some things in particular, I'm part of a group of electrocuted animals 
So we are different organizations working all over Costa Rica to see how we can work together. I'm part of another group with other rescue centers that we are talking about all the things we are facing that is complicated, but how can we do better for, for the animals? And now also I participate with these moms that we support each other. There are, there are some days that when one of us had a very hard time with a specific situation with our children. So yes, when you have people that motivates you to go to the next level, I'm not saying that you cannot feel sad, but you are going to find someone that will tell you, hey, Brooke, I'm here for you. Do you want someone to listen to you? I'm here. Do you want someone to cry with? I'm here for you. So we need more compassion. If we can be on that level, I'm, think, I'm sure things are going to be better for all of us. Mm. That was beautiful. <laughs> I could not agree with you more. And so, Do you want a cup of Costa Rican coffee? Call me. Let's go to oh, share together please. a cup of coffee. It doesn't matter that you are in Denver. <laughs> Look at this. We are together now. Yes. Actually, that's a really great idea. I also Next finished time, a virtual cup of coffee together, okay? Yes, please. And if anybody listening wants to join us, you're obviously more than invited. And yeah, we can show them how to use the chorreador. Yes, yes. And if they want to get it, I can help them with that. <laughs> yeah. I might need you to help me get some more Costa Rican coffee because I pretty much drank it nonstop when I got home and it's all gone. So I might need your, I might need your resources. It's on my list. Okay. It's on my list for you. <laughs> oh gosh, Adriana, you're amazing. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what is the best way for somebody to do that? Uh, they can use our social media, Facebook or Instagram, Proyecto Asis. Uh-huh. Proyecto en Español. Maybe we can write it down on the, here on the video when we finish recording. But yes, Absolutely. that's the best way. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Yeah, because you also run the Instagram and Facebook, right? That that is you? Yeah, I'm trying to post information and not as much as possible, you know, but it's, right. all, it's always something with meaning behind, with a story behind, you know? Right, 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 right. So yeah, so if someone reaches out on Instagram, they, they will be getting you. So that's great. Yeah, so. and then I can give them my WhatsApp number. I'm happy with that or my email address. That's okay. Or if they want to have a Zoom phone call, that's perfect for me. No problem. Or just have a coffee date with me and Adriana. That sounds amazing. Yeah, we definitely need to set this up. I would love to have coffee <laughs> dates with you. That just sounds amazing. <laughs> talk about any topic, any- not only about animals. <laughs> yes. Sometimes the best ideas come in a kind of conversation like this, not a serious mm-hmm. conversation, you know? <laughs> yes. Completely agree. Light bulb moments happen. And we're like, oh my gosh, you got to try this. Yeah. <laughs> well, awesome, Adriana. You are an amazing human being. And I am so grateful to have you on the show and part of my Costa Rica series. Congratulations. You are doing something amazing. You want to reach all, you want to give all this information to so many people in so many countries. I was checking on in your stories on Instagram. How many countries you are reaching now? How many people is listening to your podcast? So Brooke, thank you so much because as Gandhi says, you are part of the change that we want to see in the world. And this is fantastic as well. So congratulations. I wish you a new year full of health, first of all. But then full of very nice moments, a lot of knowledge from different people, a lot of mentors, new mentors for you. And a lot of love with your couple, <laughs> with your husband, con tu esposo, with your macaw, <laughs> <laughs> con tu lapa. <laughs> oh, you're just the best. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ariana. Bueno, pura vida. Pura See you vida. the next time with a cup of coffee. Yes. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.